Hey everyone, it's Kenji here with Ecotone Explorer. We're here at the Laguna Seca Raceway and attending the Sea Otter Classic, which is here in Monterey, California. It's the biggest gathering of the bike scene out west. Might be the biggest in, in the country. And this event's been going on for 29 years. And uh, we're here with uh, Lance Kamasaska. Lance is the former show director of Interbike. He is a longtime leader in the industry, has worked for brands, and runs his own business as a consultant in the industry now. And so um, Lance and I have worked together on other events like Press Camp, uh, Bike Press Camp, Outdoor Press Camp. And so I'm really excited to be here talking with you today. So thanks for making some time. My pleasure. All right. So let's start off with um, your, your background in the bike industry. It goes deep and long. So tell us a little bit in like a, a minute of kind of your trajectory as, a, as an advocate in bike. Well, I spent uh, the first part of my career working in cycling with the retail environment. Um, went through a number of different stores across the country uh, at management levels. Fantastic experience, learned a ton, but I felt at some point at the end I just needed to go a little further. So I got into the wholesale manufacturing side of the business, worked for a number of key manufacturers in the cycling industry, until one day I stumbled upon an opening that uh, Interbike was looking for a show director. Um, always admired the show, enjoyed being a, uh, a buyer at the show when I was in retail and enjoyed being a, uh, a, a, an exhibiting brand when I worked for the different manufacturers. Uh, so I applied for the job and by some reason I got it. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I was show director for Interbike uh, during its, its peak. Uh, I was very fortunate. It was the largest trade show in the world for cycling when I walked in the door. Uh, and my task was to maintain that and grow it and make it even better. So for 10 years, uh, that was those were my marching orders, and I did hopefully did that, and decided at the end I wanted to experiment and do some uh, more uh, more intimate events that would actually touch on a bigger experiential factor, and had a concept for a media event called Press Camp, which you joined me on towards the end of my time there. Did the uh, did the press camps for about eight years, uh, end up selling the brand, and now I'm actually doing event consultation. Oh, great. Nice synopsis. And there's a lot of parallels in our in our experience, you know. Uh, although I had to work my way up to show director. I didn't just, like, drop in at show director. I got lucky. Uh, I walking down the hall with you. Was yeah, great. yeah. It was been, it's been a great uh, great time together. So uh, I'm appreciative of our friendship and our, our multiple fronts uh, work together, which includes uh, making music together and um, riding bikes and uh, having fun in the events world. Sure. So... So Sea Otter has been an event. You, you you told me you've been here how many times? Twenty one in a row. Twenty one in a row. Yeah. Uh, so you are a, quite a veteran of this event, which is not a trade show per se. Right. But it's um, well, tell me about how you've seen this event change over the years and kind of where you think it's going. Absolutely. So Sea Otter, I mean, historically was a bike race first and foremost, and of course when bike races uh, take place, brands come to support their teams and support their riders. And when brands show up, they figure, hey, I might as well open the back door of my, my trailer and show product. That's really kind of the origin of Sea Otter was uh, brand support of the race that turned into an expo. And over the years, the expo has gotten larger and larger and larger. Principally, it's still a, um, it's a B2C event. It's a business to consumer event. But anytime you see a gathering of this capacity, this size, 70,000 people, Unquestionably, there's going to be media launches and there's going to be other business done on a B2B front. So we are seeing quite a bit of business taking place, usually in the mornings before the place heats up and it gets uh, you know, a bigger flow of consumers coming in. Uh, so it's really turned into be a festival that addresses a number of fronts in the cycling industry. It is the largest festival of cycling in the world at in this point. World. And the number of uh, pre-registered racers, I think this year was 35,000. So it gives you a kind of a, uh, an idea of, of the, how large the event is in terms of its importance for the race scene. And then all the, all the, like I said before, all the brand support. And then the media has come out because it is April. It's a great time for media to see new products. So there's an awful lot of new products being launched as well. Yeah, I had heard uh, that, that this event is 30% up so uh, from, from last year. And this is a 29-year-old event. Right. So uh, in a market that's not exactly exploding. Correct. Uh, I mean, cycling is pretty Relative steady. Flat, right. right? It just came from the Business Leadership Conference, and that was called out many times that we're still yeah. in a flat growth phase. But uh, yeah, I mean, it is remarkable that they it grew by 30%. Uh, of course, the demise of Interbike and the big trade show going away freed up a lot of dollars and, and freed up some resources for these brands and they, they're all in this time for this event. 
So that let's get to the business here because you know this is a little bit insider trading, but you know that the Interbike show, the big trade show for the industry, has uh, been canceled for 2019. Um, that does free up budgets for doing other events like Sea Otter, so that could certainly explain some of that 30% increase. Of course, I think so. um, but there's of course a lot of B2B business that has to be done as well, mm -hmm. um, meaning business to business. Um, for those of you not in the business, um, <clears throat> you know, selling to retailers, direct to consumer, uh, some of the marketing <coughs> initiatives that combine retail and brand initiatives, all those things have to happen somewhere. So. Um, there's a push for the bike industry to join the outdoor industry at the November Outdoor Retailers Show mm -hmm. in Denver mm -hmm. this year, and uh, there's people certainly talking about that. Also, here at this event, we've seen some more outdoor relevant um, stories being told right. and from brands. So what's your take on kind of that idea of November uh, joining the outdoor group? Sure. Um, I think the jury's out on the November date, frankly. I, it's, we've never had a trade event in all my years of doing work in the cycling industry in the late fall. Um, on one hand, it is a good time because retailers are relatively freed up. They're not in the peak of their season um, addressing uh, numerous amounts of cycling that are taking place, unless maybe you're in California or some other, some other location where the weather is permits. But um, I think the jury really is out on whether that show can grow, or that part of the show can grow legs for the outdoor retailer um, event. Uh, I'm optimistic though that there is some hunger for the event to be indoors in a more intimate setting where a proper business to business perspective can be. So I, because really now there's nothing. Uh, there are business agreements and things being done at this event and others where consumers are also mingled in, but I think there is a hunger for the industry to gather and be um, really doing high intensity B2B engagement. So I'm, I'm a little leery to say yet whether it's got my full endorsement, but I think it's got potential. Oh, good, good to hear that. I think, you know, thinking about my years with Outdoor Retailer and, and working the shows, um, it's surprising and it's, it's, um, it's surprising to me how different it is to have a B2B conversation in the same setting or context of a B2C right. or a consumer event like this. Right. And uh, I, I remember bringing that idea up to many leaders in the outdoor industry and they, they were challenged with that. Like, I, you know, I can't change hats that fast. Right. I can't change displays that fast. I can't switch my, my uh, modus operandi from talking to a consumer about current products that are at market and then put my hat on and say, let's, here's what's happening next year, but not have that conversation that's, with, that's exactly right. the, uh, with the consumer. So, it's become very uncomfortable. It's a difficult dance, and right? The teams are sometimes specialized in one area of the business and others, so right. it's a matter of trying to keep the teams intact that you need for a consumer event versus the teams you might bring to a B2B or a business event. So it gets complicated, and I think you're right. I think people really want to be in, a, in an arena where they know exactly what their mission statement is and work in that capacity. And that's where I think cycling is, is kind of longing to get back with another B2B business event. Well, interesting. Well, good good insights, Lance. Appreciate you um, sharing that with us. Um, let's get around to some of the like in the bigger industry topics where it touches outdoor. You know, I've seen some, you know, I wasn't here last year, so two years ago, I don't remember seeing Winnebago or Van Do It or these kind of um, van life, um, adventure conversions, rooftop tents. I saw some of that before, but right. it feels like that's a, a growing trend here. Are there other things um, that you feel like are, are trending in the bike industry that are relevant to outdoor? I do. I, I think the tie to what you're seeing, when you see Winnebago and some of the outdoor industry uh, companies that you're familiar with at an event like Sea Otter, it ties to the, the one segment in the cycling industry that's actually growing, which is called gravel. Uh, gravel are, I mean, for the simple way of putting it, it's really a hybrid bike that falls somewhere between a, a full-blown road racing bike and a full-blown mountain bike. Uh, they're designed more towards the road style of riding in terms of the drop bars and the way you position yourself on the bike, but they have different frame geometry that makes them more comfortable. They have bigger wheels and tires so they can go over anything, and the gearing is lower so you can do a lot more climbing. Gravel bikes have become really the bike, if you were going to go out and buy one bike, and your budget permits that one bike to hang on a hook in your garage. The gravel bike can meet so many different needs uh, for that consumer. So 
think of it this way: if if you're now engaged in gravel bike riding and you have and you own one of these machines, you're going to be spending a lot more time in the great outdoors. Uh, you're not going to be riding on on asphalt. Most likely, you're going to be on on fire roads and trails. And I think we're seeing that the outdoor industry is responding to that, and they're attending events like outdoor, excuse me, at, like Sea Otter Classic, to try to cross over and be a part of that that consumer's uh, next purchase. Ah, very cool. I, I did so. Thanks for that. Like, I, gravel was always a little mysterious to me. Like, is there a new trail? And you and I have attended some uh, cross uh, cyclocross races. Correct. Yeah. Are those done on gravel bikes? Interesting comment because uh, the gravel bike really is a derivative of a cross bike. Uh, cyclocross is a is a massive sport, a massive cycling discipline in Europe, where it, it was actually started because professional cyclists needed a winter activity to stay fit. So they designed these bikes to ride on dirt and gravel and snow and ice, and they would race in these in these elements, uh, which was very very fun to watch because there's a lot of slipping and sliding and a lot of a lot of running with the bike and going on and off the bike quite a bit. Uh, the pros loved it because it kept them fit, and the uh, the, the end users, or I should say, the uh, the public, loved to watch it. It was really fun. So cyclocross is a very old discipline of Europe. I bring it up because a gravel bike shares so many of the same types of design features, particularly the geometry being more relaxed and these bigger wheels and tires and the lower gearing. So. Really, you could almost call European cyclocross bikes gravel bikes, and vice versa. Oh, very cool. More insight. Uh, so uh, Lance, obviously, is a, a great leader and very insightful in the bike industry. If people wanted to reach out to you, they wanted to gain more uh, of your expertise or, or um, put you in play with their business, I mean, how could they reach you? Well, I can give you my, my email. My work email address is my last name, Kamasaska5150, because I'm a little nutty. Uh, at gmail.com well we'll uh, share that in the show notes so you'll be able to find it and find Lance uh, if you have further questions um, let's see well as a wrap up are you racing at all uh, I'm not racing this time no not this taking, time taking, taking the weekend off yes <laughs> yeah I've ridden with Lance before it's no fun to try to keep up with him so um, well thanks for making so much time for us Pleasure. and sharing your insights and and we'll uh, put your contact info in the in the notes and all right, this is Kenji again with Ecotone Explorer here at the Laguna Seca Raceway. We're in Monterey, California, attending the Sea Otter Classic. If you're interested in more of Ecotone Explorer, give us a subscribe or leave a note uh, underneath and appreciate you following along. We'll see you uh, around the bend. <laughs>